Just then, his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into the town, and told the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have bought him something to eat? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, Jesus told him. them. Don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored and you have benefited from their labor. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman had said. When she testified, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you have said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the saviour of the world. This is the word of the Lord. This morning, we are making our way uh, through John chapter 4. We've uh, been in John chapter 4 for the last several weeks. This week, we're looking at uh, the the latter half of John chapter 4, continuing on through Jesus' interaction with uh, this woman at a well in Samaria. So uh, this is an exciting portion of Scripture, and it would be remiss uh, if we did not go to the Lord one last time, uh, because I certainly need prayer as we open up his word. So let's pray together. Gracious and heavenly Father, we, we come now before your living and active word, the word that you have written that is inspired, inerrant, authoritative to convict and convert sinners to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, where else do we have to go For you alone have the words of eternal life. And for centuries, Lord, you have saved sinners through the preaching of that word. The spirit that works in and through that word, Lord. We ask him to come now. To dwell in this time of worship in your word. So that we would see the riches and the treasures that are found in Christ through John chapter 4 here this morning. Father, give me clarity, give me unction, give me the ability and give us all ears to hear the message that you have. May your Holy Spirit preach a better sermon than the one I'm about to preach. And we ask all of these things for our good and for your glory we pray. Amen. In his small yet powerfully compelling book titled The Message of Worship, author and pastor John Riz Bridger makes the following statement. He says, From start to finish, the Bible's story is a story of grace. It's a story of God's initiative to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves by offering us unmerited mercy and undeserved love. Worship in the Bible is never a bridge that we build out to Him, but simply a responsive journey we make to cross the bridge that He has built out to us. He speaks his word and gives his presence. And we, his worshipping people, simply respond to what he has done. 
contrary to what you and I normally believe about worship, what we normally think about worship, worship is not fundamentally about us. Worship does not originate with us. It is not something that we have created, but worship in the Bible is a responsive journey we take to cross the bridge that God in Christ has built out to us. This is what we saw last week in uh, the Sermon on Spirit and Truth. Our worship is first and foremost God-centered, and it's word-based. It's a response to the revelation He's given us, first in the gospel, and in His Son, and now in Scripture. So that as worshipers, as true and living worshipers, we're not just receivers of that grace, but we're responders to it. As worshipers, we're not just receivers, but active doers in light of the grace we've received. We're not just receivers, but we are retellers, recounters of the story of grace that has come into our hearts by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what we see here in John chapter 4 this morning with this woman in Samaria. For the last several weeks, we've seen this woman where she receives God's grace. She believes and trusts that grace, and now she responds to that grace. And part of her response after meeting the Messiah, Christ, is that she goes and tells others about it. Her joy in receiving forgiveness and eternal life results in her response of sharing that same message. And so I want to argue here this morning that as true and living worshippers, as those who have received, been born again to a new and living hope, we are not simply receivers, we're responders. So that as we come to this third and final installment, we're going to ultimately see this as the main point, true worshippers receive and respond to God's amazing grace by telling others about it. True worshippers receive and respond to God's amazing grace by telling others about it. And we're going to see this in three main scenes or sections. A woman's witness, a son's sustenance, and a supreme... It should say salvation. I forgot to change it in the first service. A supreme salvation. We'll stick with the supreme savior. That's fine. So we're going to begin in uh, scene one, point one, a woman's witness. It begins in verse 27 there. If you have a look, you have your Bibles open. John says, just then his disciples arrived and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into town and told the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? So they left the town and made their way to him. Now, the way that John tells the uh, remainder of this story with the woman at the well is really quite an amazing thing to consider. He, He begins by describing for us Uh, the situation that occurs between the the woman of Samaria and the people of the town in two major sections. Once at the beginning and and once at the end of uh, the passage. And then right in the middle of those two sections is Jesus' encounter, interaction with his disciples. And that encounter between Jesus and the disciples explains to us, reveals to us the, the deeper, more profound meaning that's occurring with this woman's witness and the town of Samaria. So whatever is profoundly going on in the middle of the story with Jesus and the disciples, that um, explains to us, that encounter describes the, the reaping and the harvesting and the people coming out believing and receiving eternal life through Jesus. So uh, we need to understand what's going on in this middle section with the food that Jesus eats and the, the will of the Father if we are to understand why the people are coming out and receiving eternal life and and things like that. So keep that in mind as we make our way through this passage. Just then his disciples arrived from the town, and, and the first thing we read is they're amazed. They left Jesus at the well back in verse 6. He was by himself. He sat down at the well. He was, he was not with anyone. They now returned back from the town, because remember verse 8, they had to go buy food to, to bring back to him. And so this is when they come back, and all of a sudden their rabbi, their teacher, is no longer alone. He's talking to a woman, but not just any woman. She's a half-blood Samaritan female, and we know as the reader she has a scandalous sexual history with men. 
So this is big red flags going off in the disciples' heads. But notice, no one said anything like, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Now, my guess is that they were just so utterly shocked that Jesus is going against the social customs and norms of the day that uh, they couldn't even think of anything to say to Jesus. They're just so shocked that they're like, what is he doing? This is awkward. Why is he talking to a woman who is socially inappropriate to do this back in these days? Either that or they may be waiting for her to leave so that they can go and talk to Jesus, uh, not in the presence of a woman. In either case... The disciples haven't cottoned on that Jesus is a different kind of Jewish rabbi. He's different to all the other rabbis in a day and age where rabbis did not treat women with the dignity, value, and respect that the Bible says they should be treated. In fact, some have have actually um, found first century sources of how the rabbis would really speak about women in these days. Let me just give you a taste. Better to burn the sayings of the law than to teach them to women. Better to burn the Bible than to put it in the hands of a woman. Gives you a little flavor of the day. Uh, Another has said to even talk to a woman in public, even if it's your wife, was at best a waste of time, at worst distraction from Torah, from the Bible. Uh, Some rabbis went so ludicrously far to say that providing a woman with the knowledge of the Bible was as inappropriate as selling them into prostitution. Now, I don't know how that logic follows, but it's obviously very holy if that's the case. Now, look, we don't know why women were treated so badly in these days. We can speculate, but I can tell you they didn't get this disrespectful women from the Bible. Because the Bible's the book that advocates that God made them male and female in his image from the beginning. They should be loved and treated with dignity, value, and respect. Thank you. (laughs) I like the amens. We don't know why they got it so painfully wrong back in these days, but we do know this. Wherever the message of Christ, Christianity has taken root in a culture and place and in a time with people who disrespect women, when, when, when Christianity has taken root in that kind of an environment and genuinely been held and believed, the treatment of women has always dramatically improved. Objectively, undeniably, manifestly, when it's genuinely held and believed and men are men who step up to the plate to advocate that women are equal in God's eyes, male and female. And so John is wanting us to see this rabbi is a different kind of rabbi. He's going to come into some conflict coming up with some Pharisees. I love how Charles Spurgeon put this in one of his uh, sermons when he preached on this. Spurgeon always got away with words. My beloved sisters, you owe much to the gospel, for it is only by its agency you are raised up to your proper place. For we do not think that you are superior to us, though some of you perhaps fancy so. (laughs) It's Spurgeon, come on. (laughs) But we are right glad to acknowledge your equality and to know that in Christ there's neither male nor female. Galatians chapter 3. For Jesus has lifted you up to your true place, which is what? Side by side with men. Wherever Christianity has become deeply embedded and believed in a culture, the treatment of women has dramatically improved. Notice what happens with the woman in verse 28. She leaves her water jar, she goes into the town and tells the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the one? So notice the first thing there is that she leaves her water jar. Why did she go out to the well in the first place to collect the water? And now the very thing that she goes out to collect, she leaves behind because her priorities has now shifted to kingdom-minded things. She leaves behind the very object she originally needed to seek because Jesus promised her living water. Her soul has been quenched by the living water of Jesus so that she leaves behind the very thing that she came to seek. 
And this is, this is symbolic. This is the pattern we see throughout the New Testament scriptures when people meet the, the true and living Christ, when they're met with who he is and what he's done, they leave behind their things to follow him. The disciples left their nets behind in Matthew chapter 4 to follow Jesus. The brothers left their boats in Mark chapter 1. Levi leaves his booth in Luke chapter 5. Paul leaves behind his reputation in Philippians chapter 2. I count all things as loss for Christ. Jesus said in Mark 8 that if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Jesus. Following Christ comes at a valuable cost But the message the Bible always gives to us is that it is worth it. It's worth it. Her thirst has been quenched by greater things as her her desires shift to the kingdom of God. She meets the Messiah. She receives him. And now she cannot help but spread that message. And notice the message that she spread. Come and see. See. Come, see. Ah, now where have we heard that before? That ringing any bells for people in here? Perhaps John chapter 1. Please turn back to John chapter 1, just a few pages back, verse 39, when Jesus calls the two disciples, Andrew and John. They proceed to leave John the Baptist and they follow Jesus. And they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? And those two famous words, come and see. Come and you'll see. Verse 46, when Philip comes to Nathanael, we've found the Messiah. Nathanael, the skeptic that he is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip says the simple words, come. Nathanael, come, see. Come and see him for who he truly is. So now we have, for the third time in John's gospel, this Simple refrain, first on the lips of Jesus, then on the lips of his disciples, now upon this woman of Samaria, come and see, come and see. And this is actually point one application of our evangelistic conversations, and that is this, that evangelism doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be this complicated process where you have to bring to them your wit and your intelligence and your humor and nothing like that. It's simply sometimes as easy as inviting someone to come read the Bible. Did you want to come and see what I'm reading at lunchtime during our breaks? Would you want to do that? I know know you think Christians are weird, but did you want to come and... See this Bible study I have at my house Wednesday night. We're going through John's gospel. And did you want to come and see a bunch of Christians sing some songs and read the Bible together? Witnessing doesn't necessarily have to be a complicated process. It doesn't have to be done with apologetics. It doesn't have to be done with super superb delivery. Because ultimately we know it's not up to you to convert sinners. That is the Spirit's job who works and wills, John chapter 3. The message you bring, you're the agent that simply presents, come and see. I mean, think about the witness of this woman for a moment. What, What reason did that town have to come and see and believe her testament? She had a reputation. She she had a story that everyone sort of knew, and there was nothing compelling austere or anything about her witness that these people should have come, and yet the town went out and were coming to Jesus. She simply invites them to come and see. And notice the people she goes back to. It wasn't the Jews, it wasn't the Gentiles, it wasn't some unreached people group over the other side of the world. It was simply the ones that knew her the best and that she knew the best the ones she'd grown up with in her own hometown getting to know. Sometimes, and I know this is hard for for us, but the best witness is done in the presence of those who are already a part of our normal, natural, daily course of life. 
our friends, our family, our colleagues, our children, those whom we know the best, those whom we've, whom we've built connections with the best. Now, often that's our excuse not to go to those people because they're the ones who know us the best. They're going to see that we are hypocrites who don't always, who aren't always consistent with the message that we bring. But that's the opportunity you use to point them to Jesus and say, yeah, I'm inconsistent. I know that. But he's not. He, come see him. Don't, don't, don't see me. Come see the one who knows everything there is to know about us. Kevin DeYoung rightfully says that we are all natural evangelists for the people and the things that we love the most. So there's no excuse not to share Jesus because we're all natural evangelists when it comes to other passions and loves for our life. You ever met a car enthusiast who knows, who knows this, what car it is by the sound it makes when it goes past? You ever met um, uh, a new parent? I've been guilty of this because I've I'm a, I was a new parent a few years ago, and yeah, yeah. Do you ever try to get them to talk about their kid? No, because they talk about their kid whether you like it or not. You're not asking about their kid, they're bringing it up. How's this weather? Well, you know who likes weather. <laughs> really? Your two month old said that? <laughs> when natural event? Oh, what about a grandparent? Grandparents are especially good evangelists for their grandkids. <laughs> grandchildren, right? You ever ask to see the photos on their phone? Don't, okay? Because you will see all 50,000 photos of the grandchildren. We're all natural evangelists for the things and the people that we love most, and so it is with the Christian in Christ. Our very heart is to promote the one who gives to us eternal life, and why would we not want to share that message about him? We've met the one who knows everything there is to know about us. So we need to respond to that grace by a simple, uncomplicated bearing witness. Come, see, believe. But here's the second principle that we need to get into our hearts. And this gets into part two, a son's sustenance. This is point number two of our sermon. Bearing witness is sometimes very successful, but normally very slow. And we're going to see that as we make our way through this second section. So let's begin at verse 31 now. John writes, In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat something. He said, I have food that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, Could someone have brought him something to eat? But Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, under the inspiration of the, of the Spirit, John wanted to make sure that we saw, verse 31, this was at the same time, in the meantime, while this woman's back in Samaria witnessing about Jesus, this conversation is taking place at the same time with Jesus and the disciples. And I think that's John's way of connecting these two events to say that what happens here and what will happen in verses 39 to 42 is connected to this conversation about eternal uh, food that he eats and the will of God the Father. Now watch as this takes place. Rabbi, you need to eat something. And they obviously saw that he was hungry when he sat by the well in verse 6, maybe. But this was actually part of being a good disciple. A good disciple would bring their rabbi food and water as part of being a disciple in these days. You would bring your rabbi medicine if he was not feeling well. And in the cases where the rabbi would die, you would bury your rabbi. So the disciples are trying to fulfill their mission of being good disciples. Disciples, they're trying to uh, be obedient to their rabbi who they've come under his teachings. Uh, but Jesus talks about a different kind of mission that he's under, which is his father's will. So there's sort of two, two missions going on here. One of them is concerned with earthly food and earthly things. One of them is concerned with heavenly food and heavenly things. One of them is focused on pleasing their stomachs and trying to please their rabbi. The other is focused, Jesus' mission, on pleasing 
God. They're not tracking with him. They're not following the food that he eats. So he explains the metaphor. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish off his work. Now, we know that food is what you eat in order to do, uh, to, to do the work that you're assigned to do. We need food to operate and to eat in order to do the daily tasks that we're called to do in our jobs, in our parenting, whatever it is. Food is what gives you strength, sustenance, vigor, and nourishment. And it's what you need to do your work. And so Jesus says, my food doesn't come from, from earthly things. My food is to do the will of God. That is, the strength that I need to do God's work comes from doing God's work. My food for doing God's will comes from me doing God's will. It's, it's, it's a circular argument to make the point that Jesus is a self-sufficient savior. He's a self-replenishing savior. This, this shines through his divinity here. He says, I don't need earthly food to accomplish heavenly things because I am the bread of heaven. I am the living water. He who believes in me will never be hungry. He who comes to me will never thirst. He doesn't need earthly food to accomplish heavenly things. Now, obviously in his humanity, Jesus needed food, right? He's he's human nature, fully human. He, He needed to sit down. He needed water. He asked for a drink. But in his divinity, which is clearly cropping back up here in the picture, Jesus doesn't need food. His food is to obey his heavenly father to accomplish that mission, to accomplish that work. So what's the will of his heavenly father that gives Jesus the joy, the sustenance, and the vigor to continue to do that work? Well, I'm glad you asked because I planned on answering that question. (laughs) There are two places in particular that I think the will of God is specifically referencing here is to give eternal life through Jesus Christ and his mission of dying on the cross. Two places in particular, I think John's gospel talks about that. There's a few others in John's gospel, but these are the two that stood out to me. John chapter 6, verse 38. Listen to how Jesus talks about the will and the mission. For I have come down from heaven... Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. So this is God's will, that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but I will raise it up on the last day, for this is the will of my Father. Everyone who looks on the Son, who believes in him, Jesus, will have eternal life. So so the will of God the Father is to give eternal life for those of us who would believe in Jesus, trust in him, In his death, burial, resurrection, the good news of the gospel, that we can be completely absolved, forgiven of our sins, and made righteous because of him. John 10, 25, this is the second place that we see this will. Jesus answered and said, the works... Now remember, Jesus said, uh, uh, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And now here, Jesus... John 10, 25, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me... And he's talking to the, um, uh, the Pharisees at this point. You do not believe because you're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28, here it is. And I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one, no one will snatch them out of my hand. God's will is that Christ the shepherd gives eternal life to his sheep, and his sheep will never lose that eternal life because Jesus holds them fast. So the will of God the Father is to give eternal life through God the Son, and the place where we see all of this come together is at the cross. That word finished there, my will is to do the... the, uh, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish. That's the same root word that is cried out on the cross where Jesus says, it is finished. So this is all relating to the eternal life that's accomplished through the son when he dies on the cross. And this is his purpose, his mission, his will, his food. This is what brings him joy and sustenance. His heart is set on the joy of obeying his Father's will, and his Father's will is to give sinners, us, eternal life in Jesus Christ. It's the whole point of John's gospel. 
Hebrews chapter 12 tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that is set before him endured the cross. His joy in doing God's work was a delight for Jesus because it's a delight for the Father. Because the Father delights in saving sinners. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save them. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So this mission and will and the plan of the Father is all coming together here in this one sentence. My food is to do the will of God, and the will of God is to accomplish salvation for his sheep. And it's something to remember when we are witnessing to non-Christians, and it seems like the conversation is going terribly. The fact that John 3.17 says he did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but that sinners would be saved. His heart is always geared towards saving sinners. He delights in this. We serve a God who delights in saving sinners. Now, the disciples don't get any of this. Surprise, surprise, we're all spiritually stupid when it comes to spiritual things. Without the Spirit's help, we are the disciples who gave him a sandwich. He's not talking about physical food. Just like the Pharisees in John chapter 2, Right? He's talking about his body, destroy this temple, three days I'll raise it up. It took me 46 years to build this temple. I'm not talking about this temple, I'm talking about the temple of my body. John chapter 3, Nicodemus. He's talking about physical birth, Jesus is talking about spiritual birth. Woman at the well, John chapter 4. She's talking about physical water, he's talking about living water. They're not tracking, they're not following. And so Jesus switches metaphors. He, he decides to, to switch it up and talk about sowing and reaping. They completely miss the food analogy. Maybe they'll get a farming one. Now, it's a little bit cryptic, a little bit confusing at first, but in essence, here's what Jesus says. Normally, when, when, when it comes to farming grain, there is a gap between the, the time of sowing and the time of reaping. Any farmer who any gardener, really, who who plants seed in their garden, I mean, you know this, if you're a gardener, you're a bit of a green thumb, you will be sorely disappointed if you plant seed in the garden early in the morning and you wait and and you don't have a crop later that night. It's just not going to happen. There's a gap between the time of sowing and the time of reaping. Any farmer knows this, any, any gardener knows this, Plants need time to grow. And they even had their own proverbial saying in the days of Jesus about this. Verse 35, do you not say there are still four months, then comes the harvest? Then comes the harvest. So they would sow, and then four months later, they would reap. You don't sow and reap at the same time, in other words. They're they're different occasions by different people. One farmer sows, four months later, another one reaps. Verse 37, for in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another one reaps. You have different times for different tasks for two different people. There's a gap between sowing and reaping. However, here in this unique moment of salvation history, with the inbreaking of the kingdom, with the Messiah who's come, The sower and the reaper are both reaping, sowing and and reaping in the same field at the same time together. Jesus says that at this unique moment, there's a unique opportunity in Samaria here for an abundance of harvest of people to come out to Christ to receive eternal life. And that four-month principle, that gap in between, isn't applying here in this opportunity with what Jesus is doing. Verse 35, Jesus tells them, listen to what I'm telling you. Here's what I'm saying. Open your eyes, look to the fields, because they are ready for harvest. And I think at that point, the Samaritan people were coming across the fields in droves out to the Messiah, and who's leading the pack of these Samaritans? But this woman who's just told them, come, see a man. So some of your translations will say the fields are white ready for harvest, and I think that's a reference to the the white gowns that the Samaritans wore as they came across the fields ready to meet Jesus. And so Jesus says, lift up your eyes, take your eyes off this earthly food and look to the heavenly food that I'm eating right now in the salvation of this town that's coming. Get your eyes off earthly distractions, look to the food, this is my Father's will right here. The fields are white, ready for harvest, and you disciples are distracted 
by this earthly food. And notice what's at the heart of the harvest. What, what, what will this harvest produce? Verse 36, the reaper is already receiving pain, gathering fruit for what? The eternal life. So that's the connection between what is happening with the woman's witness, the people come out to Jesus, the will of the Father is to give eternal life, my food is to obey that will, and here's these people coming out to receive eternal life. There's a harvest of souls who will put their faith in Christ. And so what is happening here at this moment with the people is directly related to the food that Jesus eats. And so that four-month principle of sowing and reaping doesn't apply here in Samaria to how God's work, God works. And sometimes it also doesn't apply in witnessing. Jesus says, look, already, says Jesus, not four months from now, already the reaper is receiving pay and gathering fruit so that the sower and reaper are both rejoicing together. So things were happening so quickly, in other words, so miraculously, the Spirit of God was moving so powerfully in that day in Samaria that the sower is sowing seed and right behind him is the harvester sort of picking up. It's growing so quickly and so rapidly that the word is spreading in the people's hearts and they're both rejoicing at the same time. No delay, no four-month gap, because God has given this amazing harvest of faith. And so he says to the disciples, so that now you can reap where you did not sow. In other words, the disciples didn't labor for these people coming over. The disciples didn't go into the town and, and witness to the Samaritans. The woman did. People have gone before the disciples who've planted the seed, sown the gospel, prophesied Messiah. They are merely reaping the harvest that they didn't even sow. They're receiving these rewards for people who have labored before them. Now, we're not sure who Jesus is referring to, to the people going before them who have planted the seed. Some say John the Baptist was in this area, you know, preaching when he's baptizing in Anon near Salim, which is kind of near Samaria. Others say they have the the first five books of the Bible, so maybe it was the Old Testament um, witness of the seed of the woman. Um, And still others think, and I think this is probably closest, is that the the people who have labored is um, Jesus and this woman. This woman's the one laboring in town. Disciples didn't labor for this. The only thing they bring back from the town is food. This woman goes in, all a five-minute convert brings back a whole town, a whole harvest of people's souls. So they've known Jesus longer, and their priorities are lower than this woman's. That's a bit of a scathing rebuke for us, as for those of us who are kind of crusty, older Christians who've known Jesus longer, and We don't really have the passion we used to when we were fresh Christians. You always know when there's a fresh Christian around because they're so enthusiastic and it's it's a beautiful thing. And it's something we tend to lose as we get comfortable with the Bible. Something that we need to remember that we, we can't lose that passion. They are merely reaping where they did not sow. And so this is where that second point actually starts to really come into effect because bearing witness is sometimes a successful harvest, but most normally there is a four-month gap. There's a delay, in other words. Don't focus on the literal four months. Normally there is a gap between the time of planting and the time of reaping. So that in your life, here's the point, if you see this great evangelistic success that you've shared the gospel and someone's come to faith through that message, that is not just owing to you. Many others that you don't know about have labored in their field, in their hearts, planting the seed. You were merely the tool that God used to witness. It's something I'm I'm quite often reminded of, or I'm going to at least start to remind myself of when we have the baptisms in the pool up here or when we have new member inductions. These these precious souls that have come to trust and get eternal life. The countless hours that mums and dads and grandparents and brothers and sisters and pastors and, and friends and family and co-workers have put into those people, getting baptized or the new members. And we as Grace Bible Church, we get to reap where we didn't really sow. Some of you have sown into the lives of people who do get baptized, and that's a beautiful thing. But this is why witnessing 
sometimes is very successful, but normally very slow. Because Jesus says the normal progression of things is normally there's a four-month delay. Normally there's a sorrow and reaper. Normally, when you witness, people don't always repent there and there when you share the gospel with them. Normally there's a gap from the time that people first hear. There's a bit of processing, a bit of time I was saying this the other week, how many of us got it the first time? The first hundred times, the first thousand times. There's a gap between hearing and believing. And that gap is there to remind us when you witness, witnessing sometimes feels like a total waste of time. But it's not. Because in most cases, most normally when you talk to people about Jesus, when you witness The seed is still getting watered. They're not at the time of harvest. And so those evangelism moments that you and I have that seem totally, the person just throws us off. You don't know what they're thinking when they leave that conversation. You don't know the the seed you've planted or the the seed you've watered in their hearts. You, You don't know because it's God who gives the growth. I love how Kevin DeYoung puts it when he says this, you will never see in this life all the good that your sowing has done. You will never see in this life all of the good that your sowing has done. And then he gives a great illustration that I'm going to steal and give you now. Dory, finding Nemo, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. That's, he says that's the message the Bible has. Just keep sowing, just keep sowing, just keep sowing, just keep... You're not going to run out of seed. He says sometimes it'll it'll do us well with a little short-term memory loss. You preach the gospel, they forget that. They didn't, you know, God will work. I'll go to the next person. Just keep sowing, just keep sowing. Because you don't know where a person is on the scale of salvation. They could be five minutes from conversion. They could be five years. The point is not for you to know. The point is to just keep sowing. Your witnessing efforts are never in vain because we know the Lord of the harvest. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians? I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the growth. So friends, make it your aim to sow generously, abundantly, joyfully, faithfully, whether or not you reap a harvest, a fantastic harvest, or whether you don't, because God gives the growth. He gives faith. Your job, come and see. And that leads us into our third and final section of our text here this morning. A woman's witness, a son's sustenance, and now a supreme saviour. Really, a supreme salvation, but I missed my opportunity to change that in between services. Verse 39. Now, here's here's the harvest, here's the fruit of this woman's witness. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him. Because of what the woman said when she testified, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe, I'll add this, just because of what you said, since we've heard for ourselves and know that this is really the savior of the world. Well, in other words, his witness confirms the initial witness that she brought to the town. So she brings him to Jesus. They, they ask him to stay there a few more days. And through getting to know, getting to see, coming out and meeting him, and, and he stays there. It's, remember, there's a gap. They believe and they receive salvation. Now, I love this part of the story because it sort of gives this satisfying conclusion to something that we've, we've sort of come along on a journey with back in... Remember in chapter 4, he had to go through Samaria. We saw he had to go because there's a woman at a town, because God is seeking true worshippers. And now we see the ultimate picture of why he had to go through Samaria. There's revival in this town. And I I love how John points us to this twofold witness, sort of the woman's witness and and Jesus' witness. God uses her witness to bring people to his witness. Verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what she said, the woman, when she testified, that's that's her witness. Verse 41, though, many more believed because of what he said. 
So that's Jesus' witness. And then verse 42, we no longer believe because of what you said, that's the woman, since we have heard for ourselves. That's Jesus' witness. So all of that to say is that God, this is the third, third principle that I want us to see. An effective witness, God uses an effective witness most powerfully seen through the testimony of very messy people. God uses messy people broken, sinful people like us, like he did with this woman, to bring about his great salvation. Verse 39, Now many Samaritans in that town believed in him because of what the woman said. Now remember, they didn't have to pay attention to her. They didn't have to come out and see. There was no reason, there was no compelling reason to believe that she'd met the Messiah this five-husband woman, now on her sixth. You imagine what they're thinking? Here she comes, five-man Mandy. She's coming out. <laughs> I mean, that's what we would be thinking. She was an immoral, unrighteous, adulterous, female sinner. You take that, you throw her into a town that she's completely avoiding, and bring about a revival. And yet... God uses that to bring his salvation. Her scandalous past, see a man who's told me everything I did. There's no hiding from this man. And yet he uses that testimony to show his grace is greater than our sin. When the gospel takes root in the life of a human sinner, our deepest shame can be used for his great glory. This is what the gospel does. This is how God works. Your former life, friends, is dark, it may be deep, it may be shamefully wicked and full of sin, but it's never wasted in the gospel. It's never wasted in Christ, especially when it comes to bearing witness about where God has, has trudged you and brought you from, the muck and the mire. Remember what Paul says in, in 1 Timothy 1 when he gives his testimony, though formerly I was a blasphemer and a persecutor of the church, an insolent and arrogant man, God showed mercy to me and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in him for the saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, sinful, messy, broken people and it's those people he uses to bring his message to the nations. The gospel is the only message, friends, that can redeem our broken past. It's the only message that we have that can redeem our broken lives, our past sins, our mistakes. Are you currently in a place right now, in a, in a room this size, I'm, I'm guessing all of us are, where you are going through an absolute terrible season, right? Your wife is now filing for divorce? Your children are wayward and not walking with the Lord? Postnatal depression? A child with special needs? No situation, no brokenness, as hard as it is, and, and it's right to grieve and feel the pain of a, of a fallen world, but it's never wasted in the gospel. God uses your messy life to bring his witness to messy people. For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And see the good that God worked in this situation with the town of Samaria coming to faith. And so this, this account is here for us, for those of us like me and many of you who try to give excuses for not sharing the gospel. All right? This is here so that no one in this room has an excuse that I'm not qualified to preach, to, 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 to go to someone and to invite them into a Bible study, to invite them to church, to, to talk to them about Jesus. No one's disqualified, especially given your horrific background. The thing that you are most ashamed of, that's often the thing that God uses to bring people to him. And once they're there, once they see him, it's not ultimately your testimony that saves them. It's his grace. We no longer believe because of what you said. But we have heard, we've seen, we know for ourselves, faith has come 
through the testimony of this woman because they see who he is. God uses her testimony to bring a supreme salvation. And that's the message that we see here this morning for us, Grace Bible Church. Do you have a messy testimony to tell? Do you have a messy past, a messy background, so many mistakes you've made and trials that you go through? Make it your aim to go to the people, to your friends, to neighbors, to colleagues, and tell them the amazing grace that has been shown unmerited mercy and undeserved love. And when you're there, remember the three essential truths that we've learned. Witnessing doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't normally look successful. Don't expect a harvest there and then. And it's often done through your broken, messy past. Don't be shy to talk about what you once were and what God has now made you in Christ. And the reason he does all of this is so he gets the glory and we get joy as well. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you once again for the sustenance of your food that has come to us in the scriptures. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us a clear, decisive, authoritative command to go, to retell the story of grace that has transformed our hearts. For, for how could we have the cure to the most deadly disease on this earth, sin, and yet not tell others about it? Lord, I'm preaching to myself through this sermon, through this prayer. So I ask, Lord, in those moments that we're, we're, we're terrified, we, we, we have the fear of man, we're scared, embarrassment, ridicule, whatever it is, Lord, may the light of his face shine ever brighter than that current situation. That we turn our eyes upon Jesus to look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Amen.